everybody. It's time to wake up. Uh, sorry some of you haven't got a seat. You know, you're welcome to sit at the front on the floor wherever you like, but it's great to have a, great to have a full house. Uh, now, I suppose the first question I have to ask you and ask myself, are you ready to get lucky? Yay! Hey! Oh, that's what I like to hear. That's what I like to hear. Now, is it going to be a little bit of luck or a lot of, lot of luck? A lot of luck. Laura, Laura. Okay. Well, I'll, I'll try and do that. But, you know, even if you only get a little bit of luck, a little bit of luck can go a real long way. So, I guess I've been interested in luck all my life. I've always thought myself to be a lucky person. I remember when I was a kid, I went to some thing and, you know, you buy a raffle ticket and I was convinced I was going to win a, a, a tin of chocolates. And I did. And, you know, a tin of chocolates, that's long gone. But the thing is, there are some things that people do who are lucky. And for the, particularly for the last four years, that's what I've been trying to find out. What do those people have that, that we don't? What do they have more of that we don't? Because if we can find out what it is, we can start doing some of the stuff that they do. Is that what we're interested in? Because my plan, my mission, is by the time you leave here in about 40, 45 minutes' time, all of you, you're going to know what you have to do to grab at least a little more luck. And I've been doing this long enough now with enough people that I know this stuff works. I can't sometimes explain how it does, but I don't need to find the answer to that as long as it carries on working. Now, there's a couple of people in the audience who were here in January 2014. And that's when I seriously got into this subject. I was giving a workshop, and at that time, you've got to have something when you're a mind coach like I am, something to talk about. You can't talk about everything. So I thought, now, what do people want? Well, they want to be healthy, they want to be wealthy, and they want to be happy. Is that right? Any of you going to disagree with that? I didn't think you would. And so this is what I did. This is how I introduced the session. I said, this is what we're going to talk about. And then I was just about to move on and say, you know, what does healthy mean? What are the components of a healthy life? Because we get so much conflicting advice from everybody. And I thought, no, I'm going to say something else. I'm going to say, look, this is January 2014. Who wants January 2014 to be a lucky year for them? And as soon as I said that word lucky, I just knew that it was more than a word. And the people in the room knew as well, because I just stopped talking and there was silence. But I could see people were leaning a bit forward. They, they wanted to know what was coming next. And I actually had goosebumps. And I didn't know why this had happened. But I knew then that I was going to spend at least the rest of that year trying to find out what it is that's so special about this word luck. And so I went away. In fact, the luck started kicking in immediately because I was flying up to Edinburgh straight after that workshop because I was working with a client at a major event, and it was a, a new client. And uh, this was a five-day event, and she'd had all kinds of problems in 2013. It wasn't a good year for her. And her luck changed immediately, because we spent four days up there, and she was in a big tournament. And I'd like to say that she won. Well, she didn't win. She came second, because sometimes, you know, you can only get so close. But the fact is, is that she won about three times as much money in those five days as you had in the whole previous year. So, you know, that felt, okay, Steve, you're on to something here, keep going. And I did keep going. And I spent probably about nine months researching luck, reading as much as I could, studying philosophy, because some of the stuff I'm going to talk about, I definitely didn't invent it. It's been around for thousands of years, but sometimes we've forgotten what it just might be. And I talked to a lot of people and uh, as soon as I talked about luck, there was quite a common response I got. And there's a lady here who said, uh, well, I was just chatting to her, and, and, and by synchronicity, probably won't have time to talk about synchronicity, but trust me, ladies and gentlemen, if any of you have heard about it, it exists. Have you all had experiences? Yeah, fascinating. But I will talk about Carl Jung. He was the guy who first talked about synchronicity. And this lady was saying, is it true, something like this, that the harder I work, the luckier I get? Is that roughly what you said? Roughly. roughly. So this was a very common expression that I got from people. And what they were meaning is that you get lucky because you work hours and hours and hours. 
You grind and grind and grind, and you need a lot of willpower, and it's painful. But if you keep going, carrying this heavy load, you're going to get lucky. Well, of course, I can't disagree. There's a lot of truth in that. But the truth is, is that it's not the whole truth. Because the whole truth, as I know from profiling people and working with people, is that some people don't work very long hours grinding away. And, and, it, and it looks as if they're not really doing anything. It looks effortless, but they always seem to be in the right place at the right time. Now, hopefully some of you are they're in that place already. But if you're not, you probably know some people like this. And you wonder, you know, what are they doing different to what I'm doing? Well, let's see if we can find out. <clears throat> so, my mission, quite simple, is to spread more luck to as many people as I can, and that's why I'm here today. Um, and because it's, in some ways it's an unselfish gesture, but in other ways it's not, because human beings are human beings. It's always about me at the end of the day, and if I help people to get lucky, I know that the energy or whatever it is that's generated, I'm going to be lucky as well. And I'm happy to say that I am, and I'm very grateful for that. And I know that some of you here as well would consider yourself very lucky people. So there we are, I'm going to spend as many people as possible, including you. And that is my promise, when you leave here, you'll have at least one thing you can take away and use immediately. I'll start with a, I suppose it's a controversial statement, but I really tr believe this, that luck is not random. Maybe it's to do with the hard work, maybe it's to do with something else. But if luck's not random, it's just another example that we can start to attract more luck into our lives ourselves. And we need luck. Right now, with all the stuff going on in the world, the world needs luck. We all do. And um, if we're truly, truly lucky, this is where you need a lot of luck, we will all discover the wisdom of how to use luck, because you can use luck in uh, ways that probably aren't very good ways. Uh, very, very brief little bit of a biography. I know that some of you know who I am, but some of you are here for the first time. Uh, I'm a medical doctor by background. I spent most of my life working in challenging locations. I spent the biggest portion of my life working in Africa, and that included working in Angola for seven years during the Civil War. So I've definitely seen life at the sharp end, and I've seen some stuff quite frankly I wish I hadn't seen but fortunately I've seen a lot of really really good stuff in really desperate circumstances that confirms to me that there's something special about people sometimes when times are tough when we face adversity sometimes the real us comes out so if there's one thing that I learned more than anything else if I was a doctor helping to look after people and keep people alive I needed to control my mind because if I allowed myself to get caught up in all of the nonsense that was going on around me I wouldn't be able to do my job and at that time my job was to to be a doctor and to save people's lives and I could, thought I was going to carry on doing that for the rest of my career but as I'll say later on in this presentation be, be prepared for surprises none of us can predict the future so 10 years ago I had a neck injury which at that time was pretty difficult for me to continue work and in fact I couldn't continue in that job I would, couldn't get the medical clearance to work as an emergency response doctor and I was still a young man even almost as young as I am now and I knew I had time to do a second career now as a student I loved surgery I loved the excitement the adrenaline of it but strangely enough I also loved psychiatry and all the other medical students would do as little as possible. I would stay there day and night reading all the files. I was fascinated by some of the stuff that I read. And I also realized that not much, certainly in the past in psychiatry, actually helped people to get better. And um, I was going to mention somebody with PTSD who actually a year ago she was in this very room. And uh, she's at this conference as well. And that's changed her life. And that was in six minutes. So there, there is something to the stuff that I'm going to be talking about. So in that new career, um, I obviously had to train with some of the best people around, and I worked with elite performers, because that's a really true test of, of whether you can really turn around performance, whether by getting people's heads in the right place, you can put their performance in the right place. I got lucky, my clients got lucky, I won't give you any great examples, I mentioned one person already, another person went out and won a million dollars three weeks after um, uh, I worked with them. And I, and I like sports, and I like following sports, and I like numbers, I like statistics. So I put my money where my mouth was, and uh, uh, when, once I started 
you know, th this journey, 2014, finding out about luck, just about every bookmaker in this country closed my accounts or severely restricted them. The reason being because I wasn't paying my bills? No, it was the opposite, because they were having to pay me and they didn't like it. So I don't do that anymore. It's probably just as well, because sometimes getting too much adrenaline, the up and down, uh, you know, I probably can do without it. But um, there we are. Don't point that at the screen, Steve. Uh, and the luck is continuing. I mean, just as an example, just the last few days, I've been invited, and this just is a great thing for me, I never thought it would happen, to do a TEDx talk. So I'm looking, and I'll be talking about the same kind of stuff I'm talking to you now. And also, we're at the best you, and I'm a finalist for us, you know, the best self-development coach. I can hardly say it. I'm in the, in the final three. I'm just frankly surprised. I know all the other people were nominated. And when I look at them, and I'll come on to this, you know, I think, well, you know, frankly, they should be there more than me. But to me, Olympic athletes, they say the bronze medal is the best medal you can get. So if I'm down to the final three, um, I've got a bronze medal. And they say it's the best because it's a surprise. You never expect it to be in the final. And to, come, to have any kind of medal is good. The worst medal is, what do you think the worst medal to win is? Silver. Yeah, because there's a lot of pressure. You think, oh, if I trained a bit harder, I could have a gold. But the gold medal, you know, is not far behind as the worst medal. Because you get the gold medal, and how do you think you think? How do, how do you think you feel? You got the gold medal. Yeah. What next? You know, is that it? Is that it? Have I worked eight years and I got that? What do I do next? Retire? And so, you know, always there's a great high for 48 hours, and then you come down to earth, and you have to think, what are you going to do? Um, so, I did all my research, I've told you something about it, I published a book, which some of you I know have already got, called Get Lucky Now, The Seven Secrets of Lucky People. And I'll have to rush through what these seven secrets are. Um, they're, all of, more of these details are on my website, so I, forgive the, the brevity. But the first thing in life, and I always have to start with that with people, is to say, well, what is your goal? What do you, what do you want out of life? You know, apparently they tell us we only live once, so we better know what we want. And very often I find people do have goals, but they're not goals that are really going to help them. You know, if, if, if somebody's goal is to say, let's say, to win a million dollars or to earn a million dollars from, you know, from their books or from their business or whatever, well, you know, it's beyond our pay grade to decide how much we're going to get paid. Other stuff has to happen first. And um, whilst you can keep that in the back of your mind, yeah, I want to earn a million year, uh, dollars this year, in the front of your mind, you should be thinking, well, what are the practical things that I can do every single day to put myself in the game to becoming a millionaire, if that's what you want? And of course, the one thing that you do have some control of, you have very little control over most things in life, but you do have some control over your own mind. And you have a lot more control than you think you do, and your mind is way, way, way more powerful than you probably recognize at the moment. So, uh, confidence. I was going to gloss over that, but as it happened, I'm just going to spend a, a, mi a minute or so on confidence because a lady came up to me, as they always do, and, and they say, you know, what can I do to be more confident? First of all, let me define what confidence is, and then it might make you feel a little bit better. Confidence is what everybody else has that I don't seem to. So you're looking around and you're thinking, that person's looking very confident, that person there, that person there but I'm not. Well, you see, they're looking at you and they're thinking the same about you. The, because the thing is, is that confidence is something that is a very fragile flower. And particularly the world we live in at the moment, it's easy to get knocked back if we allow ourselves to be. So here are a quick couple of tips straight away, which I guarantee work. And I have a number one best-selling audio book on this subject. And, and thousands, thousands of downloads and reviews and all the rest of it, and, and emails, so I know that it works. I'd like to think that it works for everybody, but it certainly works for a lot of people. And the first thing you can do uh, to be confident is to do a very simple thing. It sounds simple, but you're actually going to find it quite hard, especially when you start. And what you're going to do is you're never, ever going to say anything bad about yourself. Can you do that? Can you do that? Yes. 
or you're maybe not sure. Well, you will, you see, because we're all modest people, because we tend to be very self-critical, it's very hard not to be beating ourselves up. This little voice that we all have in our head, you've all got a voice in your head, does it sometimes say lots of really nice things and big you up? Or does it sometimes tell you how stupid you've been and, and you know, the mistakes you've made and how, you know, you, you know, you don't deserve success, that kind of thing. Is that, is that kind of a fairly common? Yeah, it is. And the people I talk to, they usually have far more negative thoughts, more far more positive. So if you say to yourself, if you follow this mantra, I will never ever say anything bad about myself ever again. After about 28 days, you'll notice that the, your brain chemicals have changed and you'll have a lot less doubt. You will be far more confident. This is pretty much guaranteed to work. Now, I did mention that we're typically modest people, so I'll add another little bit because you might be thinking, well, aren't I going to be rather arrogant if, if I just think I'm perfect and all the rest of it? Well, you see, your unconscious mind will know you're not perfect. You don't have to be perfect. None of us are perfect. And believe me, if there's one thing in life you can trust other than paying your taxes, it is that somebody is going to come and tell you when you screwed up. You can be sure of it. So they'll remind you. You don't need to remind yourself. So that's the first thing you can do. The second thing you can do, and funnily enough, there is a supermodel in the audience, and she knows a lot more about this than me, and she introduced me to it. But the models say, what you do when you're on the catwalk or the stage is you fake it until you make it. If you're like an England soccer player taking a penalty in the World Cup, how do they look? Do they look confident? They don't. There's something about that white England shirt. They look as if taking that penalty is the last thing in life they want to do. And it's not surprising that our record is worse than almost any international team. So I've been asked, you know, I've been asked about the England cricketers. What would you do if you were manager? Would, I think it was Lorna Dunkley said, what would you do? Would you tell them to pull their shoulders back? And, you know, funnily enough, that's exactly what I was going to say, because that's what faking it Till you make it means you look the part and if you stand tall if you pull your shoulders back if you look people in the eye then not only will you look confident but because of our body physiology you will start to feel more confident so those are two simple tips none of them are rocket science you can all start doing them today are you going to do that yes 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 thank you visualization this, with the psychologists talk about visualization, I could talk for all day on this, I'm not going to. The basic thing is, we think in terms of pictures, even blind people. More of our brain is taken over with processing what we see than anything else. And if you can't see something, it ain't going to happen in your life. If you can't see what you want to be, if you can't see what you want, if you can't see how you look to other people, if you can't see yourself winning a prize, it ain't going to happen. So the worst, you know, the worst you, thing you can do is not, is not to visualize stuff. The best thing you can do is put a picture to everything. And if you need reminding, put pictures in your house, on the fridge, wherever you want to be. Now, there's another person in the audience who's a lucky person. I'll tell this story. I only heard about it today, but it made me laugh. There was a prize of a five-star holiday at the, at the Best You last year. You know, it was a lottery. You had to draw the winning ticket. This person, who will remain anonymous, wasn't even here last year, and he won that prize. That's pretty cool. That's pretty lucky. Mindfulness. Mindfulness is important. Never more now than, than ever, because there are so many things that stop us being mindful. Mindfulness is a normal state. When, ba when ba babies are born and when children are small, they're naturally mindful. But as they get older and older and older, we become less and less mindful. And we've got these wonderful smartphones. We've got the, the texting. We've got the, uh, the social media things. We're being interrupted in our work almost every minute by stuff. It's very hard to be mindful with all of these distractions going on. And the teachers, some teachers are very worried about this. And I think that they're right. Hypnosis. Well, definitely don't need to go into hypnosis now, but I'll mention it very, very briefly in passing. But, but I am a hypnotist, and I try and get messages across the easy way, which is to get people into a relaxed frame of mind. And everything that I do and say is designed to do that. That doesn't mean to say that I can make anybody do anything that you know, they don't want to do. Hypnosis doesn't work like that. All it does is to help you do things that you do want to do. And if you want to get lucky, and you, you do quite rightly, don't we all? 
then this is going to help the pill to go down. Um, resilience, again, resilience is like a selection test. All the successful people I've met, I've worked with, I've written articles about, I've profiled, every single one that I can think of, they've all had a period in their life when they were going to quit. They, they just weren't getting anywhere, their records weren't selling, uh, their sporting career was lousy, they, they were actors who were going to audition after audition after, they were never getting the part. And it's almost when you reach that point of wanting to quit that, generally speaking, something magic happens. So when two actors meet, they will always say, never give up, never give up. And it's true. And I would say that to anybody. I say that to myself enough times. Don't give up. Keep on going. Because it's there to test us. Magic. Magic is all the stuff I put in this book about magic. I can't explain. I wish I could. But it's how the first client that I worked with was a golfer who, who within three months got a hole in one then another hole in one, and then a third, three holes in one. I mentioned the guy who won a million dollars after working with me. I can't explain that. It's just something seems to kick in. And that was the book, and it's a good book. I'm not, yeah, thank you. I, I'm not saying it was a good book, by the way, because I don't know. I wrote it. I can't tell you whether it's a good book or not, but I can tell you that it's had some good reviews. I can tell you I've had a lot of emails from people from around the world, so it's good. But... The enemy of the best is the enemy of the good. Uh, the enemy of the best is the good. So I felt that this was unfinished. I felt that I needed to, be, to provide a little more information about the magic, and um, that's what I'm going to be talking about now. Um, us human beings, we are slow learners. We do not learn stuff quick, even though our brain actually does like to do things quick. But for some reason or another, we don't do it. We've been shambling around this planet for about 10 million years, which sounds a heck of a long time, but in terms of evolution, it's nothing. Um, four million years ago, we were able to walk on two legs, a big breakthrough. And um, three and a half million years ago, we, we, through evolution or creation, whatever you believe, we learned how to do this. It's called an opposable digit. It means when we can do this, we can make tools, we can break rocks, uh, we can make spears and kill people and kill animals. I don't, I'm sure that's not a good thing, but the fact is it gives, gives us an advantage over every other animal. Uh, then we learned how to make fires, and that's good because we were hunter-gatherers then, and there's a lot of food we can't eat, we can't digest it. But once we can cook it, it, it gives us a supply, uh, uh, supplies of a lot more food, and it allows us to grow as a tribe, which we did. 500,000 years ago, uh, we were living in peaceful, more or less peaceful coexistence with the Neanderthals. Something obviously went wrong because there are no Neanderthals left, but they are. Because in our DNA, we still have traces of the Neanderthal. So that means, at some point, these two different tribes must have been breeding. Um, now, then, we actually were psychic. That was the good thing. That's where we were smart. Uh, we couldn't talk to each other, but we certainly were very good at nonverbal communication. And we knew stuff without having to think about it. We knew when was the right time to go fishing. We knew when was the right time to plant our crops. We knew all kinds of stuff. But then 50,000 years ago, which really is the blink of an eye, we did something really, really stupid. And once it was done, there was no way to put this genie back in the bottle. We learned to talk. We hadn't needed to talk before, and we were doing very nicely indeed. We learned to talk, and why was that so bad? Because talk is artificial. The way that I feel right now is a reality. It's due to chemicals. But when I try and put what I feel into words, it becomes very, very difficult. So even the best communicators, and I'm certainly not one of them, we all find it difficult to explain to each other exactly what we want. Now, it's very unlikely this is going to happen, but let's say you go to the pub after this event, and, so, and your friends are there, and they say, did you go to that talk that Steve gave to about luck and you, and that you said, yeah, I was there. What did he say? And then if you repeat every single word that I've said and that on, then add on your own opinions, by the time you look up, it'll be an hour later and your friends will have gone. That is not the way how we talk to each other. We talk to it probably about 30 seconds, then we've lost attention. So you say, yeah, yeah, I went to listen to S Steve talk. Yeah, w was it any good? Uh, yeah, yeah, it's okay. Some good, some bad, some good. 
moving on. So, you see, what we've done is we've generalized the conversation. The next thing we do, because we're human beings, we will all think differently about words that we've heard from other people. That's called distortion. We add our own color, our own flavor to the words. So what you think I'm saying um, is very different to what I think I'm saying and very different to what you think I'm saying. This is the way we all are. And then on top of that, well, I've mentioned the deletion. You ain't going to talk for an hour about what I was saying. You're going to do 30 seconds. So there's a lot missed out. You know, it'd probably been better if I'd just given a 30-second presentation. But if I'd done that, you'd have told your friend, oh, yeah, in five seconds what I'd said. So it's going to be 45. So because of all this, generalization, deletion, and distortion, it means we tell lies to each other. Now, these are not bad lies. We're not doing it on purpose. But they're mild hallucinations. You've heard, you've heard of psychosis and psychotic. That is where we, we're separated from reality. And it's a very nasty, terrible disease to have. But we all have a little bit of it. We all do invent stuff that's not real. So that means that it's chaos. And because of, because of that, uh, it means we're a bit stupid. We're perhaps more stupid than we were half a million years ago. But then we did something even more stupid. Not only did we talk to other people, but we started to listen to other people. That means that when I talk to you and you talk back to me, I'm having to spend millions of my, my neurons, my brain cells, thinking what to say. And then when you come back to me, the same process is going on again with generalization, distortion, and deletion. So after all of that, is it so, um, is it so difficult to understand why we are often misunderstood? It's because we talk, because we use words which are imprecise. And that's why people get divorced People, uh, people's relationships fail, and in the worst case scenario, that's why people go to war, usually because we don't understand what the other person is thinking. So, once we got into words, uh, we could tell stories to each other, and that was much more fun, because we all love stories. But the thing about the story, it has to be um, unreal, it has to be fiction. We don't want real stories, because real stories can be too painful to us. And um, so we like stories as long as they're not true. But you see, the other half of our brain can't distinguish. When we tell ourselves an imaginary story, that part of the brain thinks, yes, it is real. So this is the story that we like. It's been around for hundreds, if not thousands, of years. So it must be a good story. Once upon a time, all the best stories and this is hypnotic language, by the way. Once upon a time, there was a beautiful princess. It's always a beautiful princess. But she was very, very, very unhappy. And she was so unhappy that she felt she couldn't take another ounce of unhappiness. And there were the usual suspects that were causing her unhappiness. It was the evil king. It was witches. It was monsters and dragons and all the rest of it. But then, just when she thought she couldn't carry on long, came the knight in shining white armor who pulled his sword and he killed every living thing within a five mile radius of the princess and then she was happy and in fact she was so happy that they fell in love he'd saved her life so they bought a pile in the country as princes princesses do it was probably in gloucestershire and then they bought and then they bought a bmw because they all have bmws and then they did for once they did something clever not, not stupid they bought a dog because if there's one thing about dogs, they are more cleverer than humans. And this dog was very happy. He knew, she knew, wouldn't have to do any work, wouldn't have to go hunting rabbits when it's pouring down with rain. That dog knew it'd be sleeping inside, would be well fed, and would have people stroking its coat all day long. And of course, they had two beautiful children. Because it's a fairy story. One was a boy, of course, and one was a girl. And they all lived happily ever after, which is the way all th fairy stories end. So by this point, once we're building up stories like this, we have lost our uh, nonverbal psychic communication skills. But the good news for all of you is that they're still in there, and there are ways that you can get... You're going to keep your language. It's too late now to put this genie back in a bottle, but you can reconnect to how people uh, thought a million years ago. Uh, I'll rush through this one. Um, we all tell stories. I've mentioned that. And the best storytellers 
they uh, know all about our reptile brain. Our thoughts do not come from our conscious mind, much, although we think they do. They come from much, much deeper down. And these thoughts that come way down in our reptile brain, they are primitive thoughts, a lot of them to do with fear, a lot of them are to do with survival and aggression and all that kind of stuff. And I think any marketing person or any politician knows the best way to influence people is to get them to be frightened of something. And we're the perfect subjects for them because there are so many things that we can be persuaded to be fearful of. And we make a big uh, mistake because we think that anxiety and fear are the same thing. And they're very, very different. And let me explain why. You will all have been exposed to fear at some time, I would imagine. And fear is when you are at imminent risk of serious injury or illness. There's something bad going on in your life. It could be a car accident or, or you know, there are many things like this that happen. That is real fear. And if you've been through fear, uh, and I have as well, um, the thing about fear is that actually you're not frightened. When it's actually happened, something happens. Well, what's happening is that your brain is, is pouring out all of these neurochemicals that are designed to keep you alive. And, the, the, you know, your body does not want to be fearful. It needs to be primed for instant action. To, to, to do one of three things normally, you fight if you're being attacked, you run away if you're being outnumbered or chased by a tiger or something. And then there's the third thing that people sometimes forget, you freeze. And I see a lot of that in people. They don't recognize it as a fear response, but it is. They become paralyzed. I, I didn't know what to do. You know, I couldn't move. I was rooted to the spot. That is fear. And um, it's, it's completely different to anxiety. And this next slide shows us why. I've mentioned fear's real. It's in the moment. It comes from the unconscious mind, from the place of the brain they call the reptile brain or the amygdala. It helps us to survive, and it means we're independent. We don't have to dial 999 because the fire engine isn't going to come for 10 minutes. This won't wait for 10 minutes. We have to do something now. Anxiety is a mild psychotic thought. It's a hallucination because we're thinking of something, we're worrying about something in the future. And as Mark Twain said something like this, he said, I spent so many years of my life worrying about stuff that was going to happen in the future, and 90% of the time it didn't happen. And that is true. We all, we all know that. We all will tend to worry about stuff, about exams, interviews, driving tests, and, um, and we always take the worst case scenario. And that comes from our conscious overthinking mind. And it's a killer. Stress, anxiety is a killer. The medical evidence is quite clear on that. There's a direct link between stress, heart attacks, high blood pressure, diabetes, and cancer. So there's a lot of stress in the world at the moment, and there are, you know, being lucky, part of being lucky is reducing those stress points. It makes us doubt stuff. It takes away our confidence. This is Shakespeare. Our doubts are traitors and make us lose the good we oft might win by fearing to attempt. I know writers who have written 60,000 words and they haven't published their book and they're not going to publish it, that the, the papers are lying in their garage. I ask them why, why are you not going to publish that? They say because it's not good enough. They say it's not good enough, that's very common. I wonder if, if you've had projects that you want to do, things you want to do in your life that you haven't started or you've started it and stopped. Has anybody been in that situation? Yeah. Yeah, could, we, could you just tell me, if you speak up a little bit, and just tell me what it was? What was your project? Or could we get the lady a mic, please? A mic. In my case, sometimes I, I, I start a book and I can't finish it. <laughs> you start what? A book. Just a book. Re reading a book. Yeah. And um, at some point I just can't finish it. Yeah. And so um, I often think about some projects, but I don't even start them because I, I just think, oh, it's, I can't do it so perfectly, so, I, so there's no point of starting. So I stop myself before I even start. Okay. Well, you know, you've expressed that far more better than I could, and thank you for that. Um, and you believe me, you're not alone. So, I've, you know, you don't want to be like that, do you? Okay, well, one thing, I, you know, one, a couple of quick suggestions. I say this to anybody. People get bored with me saying this. If you want to be lucky, you have to put yourself in the game. 
And you're not going to put yourself in the game with your book. It's only half written. Um, the other thing is, is that um, do you have a picture in your mind of, that, of seeing that book on Amazon, on the bestsellers list? Can you see the cover of the book? You're too afraid to think about it. Are you going to stay afraid? Is that book ever going to be published? No. Unless something happens, unexpected. Sometimes things happen uh, that are not expected. These are the kind of reasons. This is a list that Michael Neal compiled. I didn't put this together. Um, but these are, these are the things that people will come up with as their reasons. And we don't do stuff because we have doubts about the, having enough information, the skill to do it. Belief. Belief is very common. Not having the self-belief to do it, like this lady here with her book. The motivation. Motivation is not normally a problem. Motivation is normally a problem because people are doing the wrong thing and the body's telling them that, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And my contribution to this list of Michael Neal is I put in et cetera, et cetera, because it covers everything then. So I think what I said there is better than his. I'm joking, of course. So stupidly, here we are stupid again. Um, we believe, yes, lady, I'm talking to you again. <laughs> the mistake we make is that we're judge and jury. You're judging your book. You're judging your project. You're judging your, your, your new job. And you're not qualified to do so. And it's not up to you anyway. It's nothing at all to do with you. The readers will decide whether they like your book. And some won't like it. And then others will really like it. Because people are different. It doesn't mean your book's a good book or a bad book. It doesn't really matter. The fact is that some people like it. <clears throat> is there any hope? I mean, that's, those are some fairly dismal messages. Well, there is. And the answer is a really, really simple one. I've given you a few little clues already, but this is the, the new answer, the latest answer. Uh, I wish I'd been paid a dollar for every time I've said this. Trust me, I'm a doctor. You have to trust me. Actually, you don't. You have to trust yourself. Here's a tip. Think of that time. That's why I gave you a little bit of a history lesson. Think of that time before we could speak. Your ancestors were perfectly capable of communicating with each other. They were perfectly good at doing stuff. In fact, they could do more stuff then than we probably can now. Because now it takes 100 people to change a light bulb. In those days, they didn't even have a light bulb. But they basically had a thought which was transmitted immediately into action. So we were psychic. We knew stuff that was going to happen. And by psychic, I mean because our conscious mind was quiet and not distracted with all of those distractions I mentioned earlier, we had intuition. You all have intuition now, but your ancestors had more of it. And if there's one thing, one word that summarizes everything I do with clients, it is I develop their intuition skills. So that they start to have belief. They start to trust themselves. They start to make clean decisions. They start to feel more confident. And guess what? Title of the talk, they start to get lucky. Now there's a lady, I'm always, I some, often ask, them, ask this question at the beginning of my talk. Is there anybody in this room who is unlucky? And I can pretty much guarantee in every room there will be one person. And I know that there's one person in this room because she dropped by the stand earlier today. And I want to know a little bit more about this. Could we have the mic, please, Alex? Sorry for putting you on the spot, June. But uh, you told me, you, can you just tell us a little more about why you think you're unlucky? And uh, this one here, yeah. Um, I'm never the person to win a raffle. Um, I see people at work that come in and don't do anything all day while I'm working hard. And they're still getting paid the same as I do. And, and you know, you run for a bus and the driver keeps going, but you see them stop for somebody else. And it just makes you feel like, in every aspect, you're unlucky. Okay. And, and um, do, you think there's anything, uh, do you think there's anything that you can perhaps use from what I've told you already mm -hmm. that just might make you feel a little more lucky? <laughs> yes. So, what exactly can you just share with us? What you might might do a little bit differently? Um, just be more confident. Yeah. 
um, because maybe it's it's body language when you when you run for a bus if you believe it's going to stop for you then maybe it will yeah and maybe it will and maybe it won't but whatever happens you're actually going to feel better about it now a lot of the stuff that I've been talking about is leading edge stuff but there is there is some research here which has been repeated time and time again and this is it positive things happen to people who think positively Nobody can quite explain why that is, but it's a recurring thing that keeps coming out. And it's also unlucky people, is it's almost as if they attract bad luck. I, I'm sure that it can't work like that, but whatever happens, it's, it's, it's better to think good about stuff because you're putting yourself in the game with more of a chance. If, you, if you're going to be more confident, it doesn't matter what the odds are, you're going to have more of a chance of doing whatever it is than, than if you're a shrinking violet or wearing a white shirt for England taking the penalty. Anyway, back to the good old days. Here are some simple tips. Simple for me to say, simple for hard for me to do, and the same for you. Spend a lot less time talking. What kind of talking am I talking about? S spend a lot less time talking in your conscious mind, particularly if it's a self-critical uh, self comment. And I've mentioned that. Never ever say a bad thing yourself about, about yourself ever again. Um, Facebook and all those other social media things. I'm not just picking out Facebook here because I don't want them to sue me. But they're great fun. They're wonderful, wonderful for keeping in touch. I'm on Facebook um, quite a lot. But there's a time and a place for it. If you've got to write your final script and get it off to the publisher, uh, not a good time to be Facebooking. Have your Facebook switched off. It's no good having it just down there, you know, minimized, because they know you're going to do that. So there'll be little pinging noises or little banners coming up. Your friend is online and stuff like that. And before you know it, oh, I've got to just quickly check, see what's going on. And all of that intuitive thought that you have because you are calm and in your good place, that's gone. And it's going to take you a few minutes to get it back, at least. So spend less time talking. Um, spend more time thinking. Thinking about what? Well, uh, we're not going to think about stuff in the future, are we? Are we going to think about stuff in the past? A lot of people do. And I suggest we shouldn't, unless it's something really good. Those are the things we want to think about the past. The trouble is, is that memories that people seem to dredge up most easily are those embarrassing moments when everything went wrong. Now, this is the bit that is easy for me to say. Well, it's not actually easy for me to say. Um, it's quite hard. It's quite hard to get. This is a thing you either get it or you don't. But this is the most powerful thing. And it has to do, I mentioned that your mind, particularly your unconscious mind, is way more powerful than you give it credit for. A lot of the stuff that you think you have to overthink in your mind is here. You don't need to. A lot of the sports people that I work with, when they put in their personal best, I ask them about it. What was different this day? And they said, I, I don't really know. Um, I, I just, you know, got out of the way. I just let go of some stuff. It, it was almost like somebody else was doing it for me. That is what peak performance is. And of course it wasn't somebody else, it was them, but they were allowing this stuff to come through. Some people say, they like to describe it as that, I feel, you know, I'm a lightning rod. I feel that I'm connected to universal wisdom. And all I have to be, all I have to do is to put myself in the game and stop worrying. And somebody's going to take care of it for me. Well, if that's true, that's a very comforting thought. Carl Jung said something very similar. He talked about his, the thing that he's most famous for, is, and controversially so, is the collective unconscious. He said we're all connected. All of us in this room are connected. All of this, all the people on our planet, we're all connected. We share stuff from the past. It goes further than that. He said we share it with people who are no longer alive on this planet. And he didn't say anything about animals. But if this is true, I have a feeling that we share this with animals. And those of you who've got pets will know that. You develop nonverbal communication. And they know exactly what you're thinking. You know what they're thinking. Um, people talk about invisible giants. People talk about God. I mean, there's a re reason why religion is so universal, because there's something in it that people find helpful. And if you can, f if you can take on board the fact that there's more to you than you think, that you're not actually alone, that there's something about this collective unconscious, and of course what Jung didn't know is that the common thread that we do transmit is our DNA. So we are connected. There's a lot more inside you than you than you realize. And this is, this is what I think makes people lucky.
particularly the intuition thing. So that's it. I've just been told I'm out of time. So final thoughts for you. I'm, I'm rubbing this in again because I really want you to believe it. You're special. Luck is not random. You already have. You already have everything you need to get lucky. You don't need to go out and buy a lot of books, subscribe to a lot of programs. These things are going to help you, and I'm not putting you off, definitely. I'm sure Bernardo, of the best you, he wouldn't want me to give that message to anybody. But at the end of the day, it's you that's going to do it. I'm a coach. I can't do it for you. I can help you get there. I can't do it for you. My clients produce their own results. I don't. So you've got luck. You just need where, where it's finding. And if all else fails, you know, you might send me an email. I'm quite readily contactable. And I, uh, I do actually reply to every single email I get. So that's pretty much um, all I've got for you today, other than to wish you a lot of luck. Uh, be generous with it, by the way. Luck is meant to be shared. But also be selfish, because remember what I said earlier. If you share your luck with other people, it's going to magnify the luck that you're going to get. And if enough of us do that, guess what? We just might make the world a better place, and we need that. Thank you very much.